I am Patrick, a sinner most unlearned, the least of all the faithful, and utterly despised by many. My father was Calponius, a deacon, son of Potitius, a priest of the village of Banavum Tabernia. He had a country seat nearby, and there I was taken captive. I was then about 16 years of age. I did not know the true God. I was taken into captivity to Ireland with many thousands of people, and deservedly so, because we turned away from God and did not keep his commandments. This is a copy of St. Patrick's Confession, the testimony of a man who is often considered the most famous Irishman of all time. But myths and legends often obscure his true identity. Was he a great miracle-working missionary to Ireland? Was he the one who chased the snakes off the Emerald Isle? Who was he, really? We're about to see the St. Patrick of history, quite a different man from the Patrick of legend and tradition. Patrick was born in late 4th century Scotland into a Celtic Christian culture. His religion was quite different from the Latin or Roman Christianity that was taking over in other parts of Western Europe. We don't really know who the first Celtic Christians were. We don't seem to know who brought Christianity to them. We're not even certain when all of that began. But what we do know is what they believed, based on the writings of Patrick and the others. And we know that what they believed was based on their understanding of Scripture. Unlike the theologians of Roman Christianity who appealed more and more to the teachings of church and councils, Celtic teachers stressed the Bible. This loyalty to the Bible is what separated the Celtic Christians from the much larger Roman Christian community. Because the Bible was the foundation of their faith, it was difficult for them to accept the authority of the Roman Church. You see, the Celtic Church grew up beyond the reach of Roman influence. It was rooted in the Sabbath-keeping Church that began with Jesus and his apostles back in the first century. The background from which the Celtic Christians received their Christianity indicates to us that they were strong believers in what the Scriptures said. They wanted to do what the Bible told them to do. That same background indicates for us that they got their Christianity before Sunday keeping uh, came into vogue. There is nothing in Patrick's works which indicates his acceptance of the teachings of church fathers. He appealed solely to the scriptures in support of what he believed, practiced, and propagated. So this was Patrick's religion, based on the Bible, faithful to its teachings, and obedient to its commandments. This was the religion he was destined to carry to the Irish. Kidnapped by raiders, Patrick and thousands of others found themselves carried off to Ireland to be sold like so much livestock. There he spent six long years working for a farmer as a slave. Every day I had to tend sheep, and many times a day I prayed. The love of God and his fear came to me more and more, and my faith was strengthened. And this even when I was staying in the woods and on the mountains, and I used to get up for prayer before daylight, through snow, through frost, through rain. And there one night I heard in my sleep a voice saying to me, Soon you will go to your own country. And again, after a short while, I heard a voice saying to me, See, your ship is ready. And it was not near, but at a distance of perhaps 200 miles, and I had never been there, nor did I know a living soul there. And then I took to flight. And I left the man with whom I had stayed for six years. strength of God. 
who directed my way to my good. And I feared nothing until I came to that ship. Patrick always believed that his escape from Ireland was directed by a divine hand. His own people received him back with the plea that he never leave them again. But God's plan for Patrick's life was not to be carried out in his homeland. I saw in the night the vision of a man whose name was Victoricus, coming, as it were, from Ireland with countless letters. And he gave me one of them. And I read the opening words of the letter, which were the voice of the Irish. And as I read the beginning of the letter, I thought that at the same moment I heard their voice, and thus did they cry out as with one mouth. We ask thee, boy, come and walk among us once more. Responding to the voices of the Irish people, Patrick went back to Ireland. There his career as a preacher and teacher eventually earned him the title of saint and placed him in the ranks of the world's best known Christian missionaries. But something that isn't so well known about him is this. St. Patrick kept the seventh day Sabbath. In fact, his Sabbath keeping became legendary. Two centuries after his death, his biographer wrote that every seventh day, Patrick and his friend Victoricus met together for prayer and fellowship. Some historians even think that Patrick's special Sabbath day friend was actually an angel. We really don't have to rely solely on the writings or experience of Patrick to understand the history of keeping the seventh day in Ireland. After all, ancient Irish laws governed the history of the Irish tribes for many years, and those laws stipulated that the people were to, among other things, keep the seventh-day Sabbath. It seems to have been customary in the Celtic churches of early times to keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as a day of rest from labor. They obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. As the influence of the Roman religion increased, it gradually affected the Sabbath practice of some Celtic Christians in the British Isles. By the early 6th century, it was not unusual for Celtic believers to keep both Saturday and Sunday as holy days. That's how it was during the lifetime of Patrick's spiritual successor, an Irishman named Columba. He was a graduate of one of the schools established by Patrick. Born about 521 into a noble family, he gave up his right to the throne of Ireland and dedicated himself to a higher calling. Columba based his missionary enterprise on the rocky island of Iona. He and 12 friends reached that remote post by sailing from the west coast of Scotland in small round boats made of animal skin. There on Iona, Columba founded a training school for missionaries who carried the Christian message to the Scottish mainland and all over Britain. In doctrine, Columba was true to his Celtic Christian roots. He kept Saturday, the seventh day, as the Sabbath, while Sunday was observed in honor of the resurrection of Christ. Columba taught his disciples to keep the Sabbath as equally sacred. His teachings regarding the observance of the Sabbath was that his followers would go out to the edges of the island of Iona, meditate upon creation and the things of God, and read the scriptures and become spiritually charged up on that holy day. Columba and his fellow missionaries firmly planted the Christian religion in Scotland. Their converts resisted the growing influence of Rome, which promoted Sunday as the day of worship. Columba died in 597, but his beliefs lived on for hundreds of years in the religion of the Scots. <laughs> 